Played by the Philharmonic Orchestra, led by Ricardo Moody. Taking us up to 3 p.m. at nearly 95 FM, KUOW Seattle. I'm Ross Reynolds, and today on Seattle Afternoon, Noam Chomsky, a man described as the United States' leading dissident, will talk about the mass media and his contention that it manufactures consent. Dave Bunker reviews a new album by the Fresh Old Time String Band. They perform traditional music with a twist. They call their experiments bug music. Here's a bug music treatment of the traditional tune, Tennessee Wagner. On the album, it's called Wagnerd. Also today, the future of the Northwest economy. A new report from the Northwest Policy Center assesses the strengths and weaknesses. We'll hear from Paul Summers, a co-author of the report. Paul Shellander reports on the overuse of public lands leading to an expanding desert. No, not in Africa, but here in the Pacific Northwest. We'll also hear about the tradition of hand drumming, and Dr. Science expounds on the relationship between politics and tunnel digging, all on this afternoon's Seattle Afternoon. The National Weather Service forecast is for partly cloudy skies. Late tonight and early tomorrow, watch out for the fog rolling in. I'm Frank Stacio. The President confirmed today the Treasury Department is considering as one option a fee on deposits to savings and loans. The fee would be paid by the depositors. But White House officials insist the fee is not a new tax. More from NPR's Jim Angle. President Bush told two reporters in an interview today that the idea of a fee on deposits is an option, but that it has not been formally recommended to him. And the president denied this qualifies as a new tax. He compared it to an entrance fee for Yosemite National Park. White House Chief of Staff John Sununu told reporters the fee is one of many options and that the others will be publicly discussed in the coming days. He insisted it is not a new tax, but rather a fee for the federal insurance on deposits. He argued that it was merely an extension of the fee the savings institutions now pay for the same insurance. But this would be the first time such a fee were charged to depositors. The idea was originally contained in the last Reagan budget and was recently discussed with members of Congress who reportedly gave it a cold reception. White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater said today, what you're looking at is a trial balloon. We're willing to discuss it and see how it flies. And he indicated there will be other trial balloons in the near future. I'm Jim Engel at the White House. The spirit of bipartisanship brought by George Bush at his inaugural was extended today on Capitol Hill. NPR's Koki Roberts reports on the agenda set out today by the leaders of both parties in the Senate. The Democratic leader of the Senate, Maine's George Mitchell, today responded to President Bush's extended hand by offering his own, saying that Democrats would work with the White House and the Republicans in the Senate in forging a bipartisan foreign policy and putting aside the battles of the past. In his maiden address as majority leader, Mitchell put forward an unusual sort of state of the party message as he talked about the relationship of citizens and their government, echoing several times John Kennedy's challenge to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Mitchell's Republican counterpart, Kansas Senator Robert Dole, reminded his colleagues of just how little the country can do about a host of issues both men agreed needed addressing. In talking about the federal deficit, Dole emphasized that someone will have to pick up the tab for programs like daycare, long-term health care, drug enforcement and education, and help for the homeless. I'm Koki Roberts at the Capitol. Former Texas Senator John Tower faced the Senate Armed Services Committee today in the first day of his confirmation hearings to become Secretary of Defense. NPR's David Mulpas has more. Tower made no apologies for his past record as a strong advocate of higher defense spending. But he said he recognizes that times are different now and that the Pentagon budget will have to be constrained. Tower also said he would continue to push for Pentagon procurement and management reforms. He said the department has to rise above inter-service rivalries. And when asked today if the U.S. could indefinitely tolerate a poison gas plant in the hands of Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, Tower said, no, we could not. However, he did not elaborate on what he thought the U.S. should do to eliminate the chemical plant. I'm David Maupas at the Capitol. By a unanimous vote today, the Senate confirmed James Baker III to be Secretary of State. Baker held a number of positions in the Reagan administration. The prosecutor investigating links between West German firms and a Libyan factory said that evidence of involvement was found today during police raids of three companies and 12 private homes. One of the companies searched was Imhausen, 
the firm thought to have provided building materials for the Libyan facility. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose almost 8 points to close at 2264.29. Advances led to decline 7 to 6 on volume of 184 million shares. This is NPR in Washington. I'm Robert Siegel. Today on All Things Considered, reporter Michelle Trudeau goes to work with the special U.S. Department of Labor Task Force. Child labor violations are on the rise, and we'll hear a report on the men and women committed to combating this growing problem. That's later today on NPR's All Things Considered. All Things Considered with your host, Marcy Silman, coming up at 4.30 this afternoon on nearly 95 FM KUOW. Right now, Kim Wilson is watching traffic. An earlier accident northbound 5 south of the Columbian Way exit has snarled traffic from North Boeing Field, and the right lane of southbound Pacific Highway South is closed as you approach South 320th until 4.30 this afternoon for construction. Volumes are building in the other well-traveled areas. I'm Kim Wilson with KUOW Traffic. Kim's traffic reports made possible in part by U.S. West's cellular mobile telephone. Up next, Noam Chomsky discusses manufacturing consent the political economy of the mass media. Chomsky is known for his pioneering work in linguistics, and his political writing has led the Manchester Guardian Weekly to call him the United States' leading dissident. Chomsky is an outspoken critic of U.S. policy and a sharp analyst of power. Chomsky believes that the chief export of the U.S. is terror. He teaches at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His works include Fateful Triangle, the U.S., Israel, and the Palestinians, and with Edward S. Herman, Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media. Chomsky describes himself as an anarchist or, and libertarian. You write in Manufacturing Consent that it's the primary function of the mass media in the United States to mobilize public support for the special interests that dominate the government and the private sector. What are those interests? Well, if you want to understand the way any society works, ours or any other, uh, the first place to look is who makes, who is in a position to make the decisions that determine the way the society functions. Who makes the decisions to determine what's produced, what's distributed. Uh, uh, basically the investment decisions. Now, in our, our society is a capitalist democracy. And those decisions are primarily centered in a, it's a moderately complex structure, but it's easy, pretty easy to identify this. There is a relatively narrow network of uh, corporate uh, uh, corporations, banks, uh, law firms, investment firms, and so on, and that's the center of power. Uh, they have certain; they largely dominate the political system. They staff the, uh, they, they they fill the top uh, executive positions in the government, no matter who's in power. They uh, the media are simply part of that system. The national media, the ones we're talking about, are uh, elite media, are just major corporations which are part of this system. Uh, they have an overwhelmingly dominant role in the way the uh, in the way life happens. You know what's what what's what's done in the society within the economic system by law and, and in principle they dominate. There's no public involvement in that. And it, uh, the, the control over resources and the, uh, uh, the need to satisfy their interests uh, imposes very sharp constraints on the political system and, uh, and, and the ideological system. Do you believe that the media is successful at manufacturing consent? I think you have to be able to... Here, the problem, here problems begin to arise. First of all, the media have a differentiated role. We in this book, and I and most of my research, are concerned with the elite media. Now, the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. 
that means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on, they set the general framework. Local media more or less adapt to their structure. Uh, and they are directed to what sometimes called the political class. They are directed to the more educated, uh, politically articulate, uh, generally more affluent sectors of the population. And the social function that they play is inculcating a conception of the world which satisfies those interests. Now, there are other media, too, whose uh, basic social role is quite different. It's diversion. Uh, so as far as the general public is concerned, they have to be marginalized and kept quiet. So you have mass, real mass media, you know, going to huge sectors of the population which are concerned with uh, sports, uh, movie stars, crime, sex, and so on. And they actually very often turns out that there's more, that they are more open to dissonant and critical voices than the elite media, because their their role in ideological control was quite different. Now, I don't want to suggest that too sharp a difference, but at, a, at first approximation, there are at least these two major differences. And our concern here was primarily with the elite media. And do they satisfy their... Well, I think among the educated elites, they do very, very extensively, not among the general public. Could you give an example of how they have manufactured consent on an issue? Well, we study case after case, but let's take what has probably been the uh, dominant uh, issue of the 1980s, uh, the question of Central America, which actually we study. Uh, the, there is a, an elite consensus over Central America, and within that consensus there are some tactical differences. The elite consensus, uh, which, goes, which has deep roots in American policy, you can find out about it in declassified documents from the early 1950s or 40s, and it's never changed. The fundamental elite interest is exactly as it's stated in the top-level planning documents. The United States must, I'm quoting, virtually quoting now, the United States must prevent the rise of nationalistic regimes, which are responsive to needs of the, to demands from the masses of the population for improvement in low living standards and the diversification of production for domestic needs. Rather, U.S. policy must be directed to ensuring a favorable climate for business investment, for extra, for repatriation of profits, and so on. Uh, the third world, in particular, is to play a certain, is to fulfill its function, as the State Department said. Its function is to be a source of uh, resources uh, and uh, markets for the uh, uh, in the early days for the reconstruction of industrial capitalism and later for satisfying its needs. That's the picture of the world, articulated over and over again, spelled out in great detail. And that is essentially unchangeable. Uh, now, with regard to Central America in the last decade, that meant some very specific things. It meant that uh, in, El Sa in El Salvador, it was necessary to uh, prevent the rise and proliferation of a large network of popular organizations that began to develop in the 1970s. A lot of it church-based, a lot sometimes peasant associations and unions, and a mass slaughter was set in motion, which the United States, in fact, organized uh, to destroy that. And that, on that, there was an elite consensus. There's virtually no debate over this. It's called, we call it restoring democracy or something. In fact, it's destroying the possibility of democracy. Uh, with regard to Nicaragua, Nicaragua was one of those independent regimes that's uh, responsive to the needs of its population. There was no doubt about this. You can like the Sandinistas or hate them, but it doesn't matter what you think. But the fact of the matter is they were diverting resources to the poor majority, and they were inadequately responsive to the needs of foreign investors, and they would not, crucially, they would not permit business and landowning elements to dominate the political system. And that's a signal that they have to go. And on that, again, there's an elite consensus. Now, there's a tactical difference as to how to get rid of them. Uh, should you do it by terror, contras, and so on, or should you do it by economic strangulation and uh, other techniques? And on that, there was a debate. Now, you take a look at the media, and you'll discover that they, they fit this exactly. Uh, the role of the United States in organizing state terror in El Salvador was played down, virtually not mentioned. Just to give me, I don't want to be too abstract. Let's take a concrete case. Take freedom of the press something the media ought to be interested in. Well, freedom of the press is a big issue. And you ask people, what's name a newspaper south of the Rio Grande? And if they can do it at all, they'll say La Prensa in Nicaragua. There's been a huge amount of discussion 
I mean, li literally several times a week in the New York Times, discussion about the tribulations of La Prensa, which has been harassed and occasionally suspended and so on. Uh, La Prensa is uh, a newspaper of a sort which has never existed in the United States and would not be tolerated for a moment in a time of crisis. It's a newspaper which quite openly calls for the overthrow of the government by a foreign power. We have never permitted anything remotely like that in wartime. Uh, but forget that. I mean, the Prince was harassed, doubtless. All right, now let's take a look at El Salvador. El Salvador had an independent press at one time. Uh, there were two newspapers in El Salvador which were not calling for the overthrow of the government. Uh, they were not associated with a foreign power. They were calling for mild social democratic reforms, redistributing land and so on. The government that we supported uh, sent a death squad to murder an editor and a photojournalist of one newspaper. They were taken out of San Salvador restaurant, cut to pieces with machetes and left in a ditch. That took care of one newspaper. It closed down. The editor fled. The second newspaper, uh, after a series of bombings by the security forces, was attacked, surrounded by tanks and attacked. Premises were destroyed. The, uh, the owner again fled, both in the United States. And how did the media respond to that? That's a lot worse than ever happened to La Prensa. The New York Times has never had one word in an editorial about that. They have never had one word that I can find in any news column about it. That shows how seriously we take freedom of the press. Let's take, say, Guatemala. Uh, that was eight years ago. There's been plenty of time to talk about it. Take Guatemala. In Guatemala, of course, it was a real terror state, but there's supposed to be a democratic opening that we are very proud of. Now, in last February, uh, a uh, again, a social democratic, kind of a what we would call liberal editor, went tried to go back to Guatemala from Mexico. He opened the newspaper, La Epoca, it's called. Uh, he, they ran a few issues. As soon as he came, death squads announced they're going to kill him. But he kept going. Uh, uh, there was a big furor at that time. But there was right at that time, there was a big furor because there was a shortage of newsprint in Nicaragua, and the Prince was unable to publish for a while, so huge editorials in the newspapers about how this shows that the Sandinistas are totalitarians and so on. Right in the middle of this, 15 armed men from the security forces broke into the offices of La Epoca, uh, firebombed the place, kidnapped the night watchman, uh, threatened him with death if he talked about what happened. The next day, the editor gave a news conference to which no one came, uh, saying, well, can't have freedom of the press in Guatemala, I'm going to get out. A Western ambassador took him to the airport so that he wouldn't be murdered, and he went back to Mexico. It's not reported in the New York Times. It's not reported in the Washington Post. Now, that's the way you manufacture consent. You have to focus attention. The state says we're going to overthrow the government of Guatemala, and the state says democracy, we have democracy in Guatemala, in Guatemala and El Salvador. So even on an issue like freedom of the press, you talk about the tribulations of La Prensa, but you're silent about the, the murder and physical destruction of the press and the governments that we support. But there are media that do report some Name of these one. events, such as the Progressive Magazine or the, the Nation Magazine right. and some of the alternative magazines. They do present accounts of some of these issues. Why are they not read, and why are the New York Times and Time Magazine read? Very simple. Just take a look at resources. I mean, if you want to be a ma major, it, to, 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 first of all, they're not newspapers, notice. They're struggle, take a progressive, struggling journal. It survives because people like me, for example, give it some money now and then. Can't get advertising support. Uh, it, it's a monthly, it's not a daily. Uh, if you want to function, you, the, the, this is a free country. I mean, the state is not going to come in here. They're not going to send cops in here and shut us up. They can't do that. They're not going to send out death squads. The country's free. Uh, there's a free market. But how does a free market work? In fact, our, our model of the media in this, uh, in this book is a free market model. Uh, the way a free market works is those who have resources win competition. Like, there's nothing that stops me from producing automobiles. If I want to compete with General Motors, nobody's going to stop me. But you know what's going to happen in that competition. And similarly, if I want to set up a daily newspaper, all I have to do is find $30 million somewhere and make sure that plenty of advertisers are going to support me. Uh, and they'll only support me if I say the kind of things they want to hear. And if I can get the issue capital and so on, yeah, then fine, I can produce a daily newspaper. But I can do that if I speak for the interests of those who have the capital. Otherwise not. If I speak for the, against their interests, why should they support me? You portray a public that's deceived by the media. Why, are the public, why is the public so able to be duped? First of all, I didn't quite say that. I said the educated classes are deceived by the media. 
And there you see, because it's in your interest to be, first of all, it's, it's very hard to uh, overcome this. The, the facts that I just mentioned, that's after all one example. Uh, I, I doubt if you would find one person in a hundred thousand who'd ever heard of these facts. Ha, ha, first of all, how can you keep from being, if, if the New York Times and, and the Washington Post and so on literally never report the fact uh, that newspapers are destroyed, not by harassment, but by torture and murder and so on, by the governments that we support and the security forces that we train. If people never hear that, it's not fair to say they're being duped. I mean, of, of course, if they really work, they can find it out. You know, if, if you're enough of a fanatic and you read all, you know, you, you, if you see, in fact, even if you read the New York Times, you could learn some of these things if you're really a fanatic. For example, in eight years, the New York Times did allow one op-ed. Remember, I said nothing in the editorials and nothing in the news columns. They did allow one op-ed from one of the newspapers who fled. And in that op-ed, he said some of these things. So if you if you got your eyes attuned, you know that something's going on there. And then you go ahead and you do your own independent research project. In the case of La Epoca, the Guatemalan one this summer, in fact, there was, uh, in the arts section, a couple of weeks later, there was a report of a uh, uh, cultural conference in, I think it may have been in Mexico, in which the reporter referred to the fact that this journalist was here and his newspaper had been destroyed. So if you're really an addict, you know, if, if, you, if you have the fanaticism to be a real addict, you can learn a lot of these facts. But for the ordinary person, it's hopeless. It's Seattle afternoon. We're speaking with Noam Chomsky. I've also seen studies that show that there's a, a very low rate of confidence in the mass media. People don't really trust the mass media. How how can that be? And at the same time, the mass media be able to manufacture consent? I, I think that's right. There's a lot of distrust. But the point is that the way public relations works, I mean, there's a lot of distrust in advertising, too. Ask people what their attitude is towards toothpaste ads. Answer, they distrust them. But they still do what the toothpaste ads say. say. Uh, it's long been under, we have a very, we have a, one of the differences between the United States and other industrial democracies is that we have a major public relations industry going back to the early part of the century, which is concerned with what they call in their own literature controlling the public mind. And they're sophisticated, they're not stupid. Uh, they know perfectly well that if you put a beer ad on television, nobody's going to believe it. But if you repeat it over and over, and if that's all you hear, and those are the images in your mind, and so on and so forth, ultimately it sinks in. It establishes a kind of a framework of thinking and looking at things. So people can disbelieve every single sentence they hear, and the end result is they believe the whole picture. And that's pretty much the way these things work, too. So uh, among educated people, uh, it's very hard to find anyone who doesn't believe that we're supporting democracy in Central America. In fact, we're trying to destroy democracy in Central America. But to see that, you have to go beyond the constant images and repetitions and so on and so forth. Now, I mentioned only one example, and that's very misleading because our point is that this is true of every example. I'd like to hearken back to your first example about Nicaragua in particular. That the Sandinista government is still in power. Right. There's not currently a move in Congress to provide funding to the Contras. That might belie your point that, the, that there's a consensus that's been manufactured in any effective well, fashion. Remember what I said. I said there's always been a tactical debate over how to strangle and destroy the government of Nicaragua. In fact, uh, if, uh, uh, if you go back to attitude, public opinion studies, by 1986, uh, the group that's called leaders in public opinion polls, meaning executives, political figures, editors, and so on, you know, that group, they're called leaders. They were about 80% opposed to country aid in 1986. The reason was that they considered it not a cost-effective method. If you have a tiny, weak country, which was robbed blind and practically destroyed by Somoza, uh, and is totally dependent on the United States for survival for obvious historical reasons, you can strangle and destroy it by much more cost-effective means than terror. Terror is only of interest to people who kind of like torture for its own sake. If you're a rational imperialist, oh, there are much better ways to do it. And as much as 80% of the leadership element thought we should use other ways. Now, that being the case, the media reflected this debate. I, I've done a lot of stu careful studies of opinion columns and editorials in the two major newspapers, Washington Post and the uh, New York Times. That doesn't happen to be in this book. It's elsewhere. And it's very interesting to look. I mean, there, you know, the, the, the amount, the number of opinion pieces on Nicaragua is just amazing, way beyond anything else. I mean, in one three-month period that I looked at, there were literally 85 columns in the Washington Post and the New York Times 
on the issue of Nicaragua. Now, of those 85 columns, this was early 86 when it was sort of heating up, uh, of those 86 columns, that includes their own columnists and, and op-eds, uh, 100%, 85 out of 85 were anti-Sandinistic. That wasn't even a topic. That uh, includes the op-ed pieces? All the op-ed pieces. All the op-ed pieces and their actual columnists. Uh, they were divided over how you get rid of the of the of the Sandinistas. Some said about, I think maybe two thirds were pro contra at that time. About one third were anti contra, but anti Sandinista 100 uh, percent. Particularly striking was the issues that they looked at. So there's there's one there's two very striking differences between the Sandinistas and the governments that we support, and this is not debatable. Everyone agrees with the facts. One difference is that, as distinct from the governments that we support, the Sandinistas don't slaughter their own population. Now, that's not debatable. Uh, you, uh, you take, I mean, unless you're a real fanatic, you don't question that. Uh, you may hate them, you may think they're fascist, totalitarians, whatever you like, but they have not slaughtered their own population. In fact, the number of civilians killed by the Sandinistas is maybe in the dozens, possibly in the hundreds. The governments that we support have slaughtered them in the tens of thousands. Now, that's an interesting difference. You know how many phrases referred to that in 85 columns? Zero. That topic's off the agenda. Another issue that is not, another question that's not in debate is that the Sandinistas tried and in fact succeeded in the early stages to carry out social reforms, health standards improved, literacy, and so on. In 85 columns, there were two phrases referring to that fact. Now, you know, this, ref I don't give you one, but this reflects a uniformity of opinion it's quite topics. remarkable. I mean, and, and that's very typical. If you take a look, I mean, one of the things in this, about half of this book, in fact, is devoted to the Vietnam War. And we cover it from 1950 up till the present. And over that whole period, what you, the most you get in the national media is debate over tactics. Your views are extremely controversial. And perhaps one of the, one of the things that has been most controversial and that you've been most strongly criticized for was your defense of a, a French intellectual who was suspended from his university post for contending that there were no Nazi death camps in World War II. You described him as a sort of an apolitical liberal. And you've also been quoted as saying that you see no anti-Semitic implications in the denial of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. well, Could you explain that? First of all, let me clarify the facts, which are only about half true. Uh, I didn't defend any French intellectual. I defended his right of freedom of speech. Uh, what happened is that uh, this person was uh, dismissed. After he his professor of French literature, uh, it was back, I think, in 1979 or so, after he had been, uh, he had published a couple of pamphlets in which he denied the existence of gas chambers, obscure pamphlets that nobody ever saw. He was suspended from teaching on the grounds that he could not be protected from violence. He was then brought to court for falsification of history court for falsification of history. He was condemned. He was, if you read the trial record, it was something like he was condemned for failure of responsibility as a historian, for uh, failing to use all documents properly. For He was never accused of any Semitism or anything like that. He was accused of allowing others to use his work for nefarious ends. Now, in my view, that's an outright scandal. Uh, the idea that the state should have the right to determine historical truth and to punish deviation from it, uh, that's a reversion back to the, the pre-Enlightenment period, or to be more modern, it's the straight Udanov doctrine, straight Stalinism. I was asked to sign a petition, uh, uh, said very little, just uh, to the courts, uh, asking them to observe the civil rights. And like thousands of other petitions that I sign all the time for people all over the world, of course I did it. Now that petition was interpreted as being support for the person and his views. And I was then asked by the person who initiated the petition to uh, just write a statement on freedom of speech and make some truisms about freedom of speech, which I did. I was embarrassingly truistic, in fact, uh, about how if you believe in freedom of speech, you believe in freedom of speech for views you detest. I mean, even Goebbels was in favor of freedom of speech for views he liked. You know? The only the question only arises in the case of, of views that are regarded as as Un unacceptable or horrendous or something like that. At the end of this, I said, look, this man has been accused of being uh, a, a, a Nazi and an anti-Semite. I said, if he is, that's the, the same, doesn't change the fact at all. However, those are serious charges. And then I said, I don't know very much about him, and frankly, I don't care much about him, but I have read a lot of the criticisms of him, and I read some of the criticisms, I quoted some of the criticisms, the harshest criticisms that had then appeared, 
And I said, if that's what's true, he's probably an apolitical liberal. He, in fact, was a person who was who had bitterly condemned the Nazis and praised the defenders of the Warsaw Ghetto and so on. That's it. And I certainly stand on that. Noam Chomsky, thank you very much for being with us here today. Noam Chomsky is going to be speaking a couple times here in Seattle. Both those talks are sold out. We'll be taping the one that will be taking place tomorrow night on the subject of Central America and rebroadcasting it this Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. This is Seattle Afternoon on KUOW. It's nearly 95 FM. Kim Wilson has traffic. Northbound I-5 is really suffering from some problems, Ross. A two-car non-injury accident. Northbound 5 at Alvaro is causing quite a distraction. It's not blocking. But uh, one tow truck accident a half mile south of Spokane Street. That's on the guardrail. A tow is at the scene, and they're going to close the two left lanes to remove it. At any rate, traffic is just backed up from North Bowling Field. The backup is growing. Also, a car...